Well, good afternoon. It's a, it's a blessing to be here amongst the saints and fellow creationists, you might say. Again, my name is Richard Stepanek. I do work with Alpha Omega Institute, and that's located in Grand Junction, Colorado, not too far from here, just over the mountains there. It's a beautiful drive in I-70, or if you go through Leadville, it's a pretty drive going that way too. But the only problem is this time of year is snow. <laughs> that always causes some challenges. But a little bit about my background. I've got an agribusiness degree. I went off to college, got an agribusiness degree, took the you know, basic sciences and stuff, because I love to do science. And I came back and was taking over the family farm. And we had a feral to finish operation with swine, so I work with genetics. And if farmers do not understand genetics, you know what happens to them? They go broke. Yes, we work with livestock, our livestock would mutate, and every time my livestock would mutate, guess what happened to the livestock? They died. Yes, so I again, I was taught evolution in college, high school, and the church I used to attend. I no longer attend that, taught evolution to be true, and I didn't know any better, so I was a theistic evolutionist, and some of you may not know, what's a theistic evolutionist? That's someone who believes that God used evolution to create the universe. They believed in the Big Bang, we came from monkeys in the billions of years. And then in 1990, I was 32 years old, I heard the gospel message on Christian radio, and I got saved. And I got deep into this false religion for two years and had special classes. I didn't know any better, I was just this new believer. Two years after I got saved in, in 1992, I went to an Alpha Omega Institute seminar and they taught all this wonderful evidence that Genesis and creation is true. Being a farmer and working with genetics, it didn't take me long to reject evolution. Because when I study natural selection, nobody who understands genetics would use natural selection to use, support evolution. They will not. As a farmer, natural selection is devastating to the evolution. Because we work with what we call artificial selection or selective breeding. We eliminated genes we didn't want in our livestock and kept the genes that we did. So basically you produce baby purebreds. And with purebreds, they are less likely to change. Are you with me here? You're, re you're reducing genetic diversity. When you reduce genetic diversity, you know what happens? Things don't change. When you got a purebred German Shepherd and you reproduce it with a purebred German Shepherd, guess what you have? Purebred German Shepherd. You don't get a Chihuahua. You eliminate those genes. And that's the same thing we did with our livestock and, and crops. We had test plots. These genes work well, these genes didn't. So guess what we did? We eliminated these genes and we kept these genes. And so, and then mutations were supposed to be the mechanism to change into something else. Well, that was a dead end. Being a farmer, we had livestock that mutated. And they always died. Yes, they always died. Or they struggled. We're not going this way. Everything is going this way. So when I talk with people about genetics and they use natural selection, I immediately understand that they do not understand genetics and natural selection. Isn't that interesting? Because they wouldn't use natural selection if they truly understood what it's all about. But if you ask a farmer, he will tell you because that is our livelihood with genetics. So, I basically, in 1992 then, I went to an Alpha Omega Institute seminar. They taught all this wonderful evidence that creation is true. I got all excited. <laughs> Uh, I thought my religious leader would want to know. <laughs> you got it. I don't know where I was. I thought he would be ex as excited as I was about all this. But no, we kind of got in a pretty heavy debate. And a few months after that, I left that church. Because if they got Genesis wrong, where else did they go wrong? Directly and indirectly, all of our doctrine, everything that's happening today, all of our science goes back to Genesis. Did you know that? If Charles Darwin would have understood Genesis chapter 1, he wouldn't have come up with a blunder he did on Galapagos Islands. Because everything he saw there was already predicted 6,000 years ago in Genesis. It's all there. And then I went to college and I taught that Gregor Mendel was the father of modern genetics. You know that's wrong. You know who is the father of modern genetics? Jacob. As a farmer, I'm studying Jacob and how he worked with sheep. We work with, with swine. This guy was brilliant. 
he understood recessive and dominant genes <coughs> and so on, purebreds and hybrids. He had it all down. We would be thousands of years ahead of our time if we would study scripture. Did you know that? Yes. So it's fascinating. I love to study genetics. We're going to be looking at genetics and origin of life. And is it possible we could shut these lights off? That would be great. That would be perfect. Thank you. So, Daily Sentinel, Grand Junction. How did it all really begin? How did everything get here? The debate over t teaching evolution versus intelligent design heats up in Grand Junction. You know, I was taught that intelligent design, oh, that's a religion, that deals with the Bible. You know, evolution is science. Well, when you study science, evolution is not science. It is a philosophy. Actually, I can trace every aspect of evolution back to the pagans. It's a pagan philosophy, by the way, people. It has nothing to do with science. So don't confuse evolution with science, because they are not together. So they talk about intelligent design. Well, we're going to take a look at the science of archaeology. Do you know the science of archaeology is all based on the intelligent design concept? Did archaeologists see, when we go to Machu Picchu, did they see anybody build these buildings? No. So how did they know somebody built those buildings? Well, an archaeologist, he has to tell the difference between a pile of rocks that happen naturally and a pile of rocks where it takes intelligence to pile them that way. If he cannot tell the difference between these two piles of rocks, is he in big trouble? Yeah. Yes. All archaeologists use the intelligent design concept. Did you know that? So if the intelligent design concept is not a scientific concept, that means archaeology is not a science. <laughs> Tell that to an archaeologist. We rely on this every day of our lives. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We're going to look at that. That's the most scientific statement of how everything got here, right there. How did God create everything? He used intelligence. There you go. Right. Oh, boy, that went by fast. So, the Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. He used intelligence and his power to create and make the universe. So we're going to take a look at the intelligent design concept. Actually, I'm not so much an intelligent design concept. I'm involved in the intelligent designer. Because all New Agers are into the intelligent design. There's this cosmic God, that force, Star Wars, that put everything together and so on. We won't get into that. That's another topic. But uh, there's a designer that made all things, and that's what we are involved in with Alpha Media Institute. But I need to explain what evolution is. Do you know most people don't even know what evolution is? A lot of people think just the changing of beak sizes on finches is evolution. That's not Darwinian evolution. That's just changing the beak sizes, because they're all still what? Finches. Yeah, I look around this room, I see some people with big beaks, I see some people with little beaks. <laughs> does, that, does that mean those who have bigger noses are more evolved than those who have little noses? No, and the finches can all interbreed. We work with that with livestock. We didn't use finches, we used swine, and cattle, and crops, and so on. But basically, we're not going to so much talk about creation right now. God created everything in six literal days. They were literal days, by the way. You know, God repeats himself 29 times in five different ways in Genesis chapter 1 that these are literal days. Now, why would God repeat himself five, 29 different times in five different ways that these are literal days? He's trying to get a point across. When I read scripture, when he repeats himself, it says, Rich, wake up. This is important. I remember my dad, when he repeated himself, when he repeated himself, it meant, Rich, listen to what I tell you. Otherwise, bad things will happen. <laughs> I was a quick learner. So we're going to take a look at Darwinian evolution. Basically, it's non-life. Elements of the Earth coming together to form more complex molecules. This is what we call biochemical evolution or chemical evolution. Evolution is just change. The question is just how much of a change. How big a change. Then these chemicals came together to form the first life. This is what we call abiogenesis or spontaneous generation. And then this goo or the bacteria or whatever you want to call it evolved into the fish kind, amphibian kind, all the way up to mankind. Now, think about that here this evening. If you go out to dinner and you have a plate of fish, according to evolution, what or who are you really eating? <laughs> a distant relative. What do you call that when you eat a distant relative? Cannibalism. I've been to countries where it's illegal to eat meat. 
If you eat a cow, you could be thrown in jail. I kid you not. If you eat beef, it is smuggled in. I kid you not. I've been there. Yes. But what do we have in common with fish? They're not a common ancestor. God made fish. God made us. That's what we have in common. So don't worry about eating a distant relative if you eat a cow or a fish or whatever. But uh, if you really want to understand what evolution's all about, there's a simple statement. Down here I call this goo, and up here I call this you. And where do you find a lot of neat little creatures in one nice little place? In the zoo. Darwinian evolution is from goo to you by way of the zoo. That's Darwinian evolution in a nutshell. So. This is what I was taught growing up through high school and college. And things haven't changed. Students are taught that life evolved from non-living materials. As we look at complex organic, <coughs> excuse me, organic chemicals, contain carbon were probably common. When I read these scientific journals on evolution, I look for words like probably, maybe, we think. Those are pretty scientific concepts, aren't they? <laughs> Those are religious concepts. But it goes on. However, to progress from complex molecules to the even the simplest living organism, we need to stop right there. According to science, there is no such thing as simple living organisms. All organisms are what? Complex. Yeah, you can speak to me. Complex. We take a look at bacteria. I was taught bacteria is simple. It's not. It's extremely complex. They got this flagellum. It's like a propeller. Pro propels them through the fluids. And we take a look at it, it's got a little motor. You're probably familiar with this. Maybe somebody already talked about this. It's incredible. They got a propeller, universal joint, bushings or bearings or drive shafts, rotors, stators. I mean, it's a masterpiece of engineering. It's far more complex than any motor we have ever made. This motor is so tiny that eight million of them can fit on a cross section of a human hair. Incredible. Nanotechnology, right? Again, it rotates about 100,000 RPMs and it can turn a quarter turn and then reverse itself. Sounds like it's got gears and everything. I mean, it's incredible. Now, there's no such thing as simple life. If you want to understand simple, this is simple. This is primitive technology right here. <laughs> this is complex. Whoever made this is far more intelligent than whoever made this. Yes, and these things don't last very long either. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah, so again, all this life evolving on this planet was supposed to take a very long process. Millions, maybe billions of years of time. Can you scientifically observe things taking millions and billions of years? No. no. Once you talk millions and billions of years, we're going to talk more about that, you have stepped out of the realm of science. You are now in the realm of speculation. Well, we have speculation here, pseudoscience and a religion giving evidence that life evolved by chance and accident. And I will show you through chemistry and mathematics, it will not happen. It is, there is no chance. It is totally impossible. It won't happen. So how did life supposed to evolve in this planet? Well, again, this is what I was taught. <coughs> Energy from lightning and volcanic activity, UV light and so on, was supposed to take and mix these chemicals into more complex molecules. And they were talking about that in the beginning, our atmosphere was a reducing atmosphere. What is a reducing atmosphere? A reducing atmosphere is an atmosphere where there's zero free oxygen in the atmosphere. Because if you have oxygen in the atmosphere, it's called the oxidation atmosphere. We have an oxidation atmosphere. But you know what oxi oxygen likes to do? Oxidize things. It likes to destroy things. Like if your car is turning red or orange and you're not painting it, you know what that is? That's oxidation. It does basically the same thing to the basic building blocks of life. It wants to oxidize it and destroy it. So in the first original atmosphere, according to evolution, there could not be any oxygen. It could not be an atmosphere like we have today. This atmosphere today would never produce life. We know that scientifically. So in college and high school, they always taught the present is the key to the past. Do you know they have to reject this idea? Because the present could never produce what happened in the past. Are you with me here? They only use this when they want to use it. 
But when they don't want to use it, it doesn't fit with their whatever agenda, then they change the rules. Isn't that interesting? So, but we're going to take a look at this some more. We want to talk about what would happen to life on this planet if you completely dissolve or deplete it the ozone layer? What would happen to life on this planet? Die. Because with ozone protects us from UV light. Without ozone layer, guess what would happen to you? The UV light would destroy your living tissue. Isn't that it? How, how many of you have ever went to a store and they got this machine where you can buy bottled water? You just take your gallon or five gallons, you put it in there, you push the money in there, and you push the buttons, and it goes through this step of processes. You know what the very last step they, they do before they drop the water in there? Anybody know? They zap it with UV light. Why do they zap it with UV light? To just kill all organisms. UV light destroys life. As a farmer, the best way to sterilize things is set things out in the sun. Because you know what UV light does to that, those bacteria? Sterilizes it. It's one of the best ways to sterilize my farming equipment, move it in the sun. Wow. See, that's why it, being a farmer, I learned a lot of things. Yes. Because I dealt with life. Livestock dying was easy, as keeping them alive was that was hard. Yeah. But so, when we take a look at this, if there's no ozone, there would be no, or if there was no oxygen, there would be no ozone, and with no ozone, there would be no life. But then the, there's another problem. If you put oxygen in the atmosphere, you have an ozone, but oxygen, you couldn't get life to evolve. It's a catch-22. We're done. We can all go home right now. I just destroyed the whole evolutionary process. <laughs> but there's so much more to teach. We'll continue. So what was in the atmosphere? Methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen. Through this, in, through this volcanic activity and so on, energy combined those into more complex molecules. And then those complex molecules, they fell into the water. And then they would splash, they had this primordial soup. You've probably heard of the primordial soup. And then that was splashed into little ponds, and the ponds dried up after millions and billions of years, you came to be. That's the evolutionary story. We're going to take a look at this. Do we have any evidence that at one time we had a reducing atmosphere? Because science deals with what? Evidence. If you have no evidence, you don't have a theory. Because to have a theory, guess what you need? Evidence. Evidence. No evidence? No theory. theory. Yeah. Well, the oldest rocks that they find, right here, these are pre cambrian rock layers, they find these red bands. What causes these red bands? Oxidation, Oxidation of iron. Which means, according to evidence, this atmosphere always had oxygen. Bingo. No evidence. It's not called the theory of evolution. It is called the religion or the philosophy of evolution. Don't get evolution confused with science because it is not. We're going to deal with science. Don't they say always follow the science? You know, I follow the science. You know where it led me? Rejection of evolution. Zero evidence. Well, there's supposed to be this primordial soup. If there was this primordial soup, shouldn't we find some evidence that there at one time was a primordial soup with all these chemicals? Guess what? Zero. There's no evidence for that. It's all made up. It's vain imagination. As far as I know, they have not found this primordial soup. Does the Bible warn us against vain imaginations? Yeah. Well, you're probably familiar with the Stanley Miller experiment. This is right from the Denver Museum. That was been a number of years ago. Stanley Miller and I believe you, Ray, and maybe some other people did this apparatus to show evidence that life could evolve by chance and accident. Well, I was taught, yeah, life could evolve by chance and accident, and they proved it. Well, then I got doing research. What did they actually do? What did they find? What was their outcome? Because what they sometimes tell you is most of the time not the truth. We're finding that out today. There's a pandemic of fraudulent research. Did you know that? It's not an epidemic of patent. The only pandemic we have, in my viewpoint, is fraudulent research. <laughs> yeah. I'm seeing that over and over. Just, there's just a trail of it. Yeah. 
So what do they do? Well, they had to evacuate all the air or oxygen on that apparatus. Any oxygen in that apparatus, guess what it would have done? Would have oxidized. Would have been bad. So what do they do? They put water down here and heated it up. They put the gases, the methane, ammonia, water. Well, they had water here, hydrogen here. And then they heated it up and the gases came over into this spark chamber here. That spark chamber basically kind of simulated lightning energy. And it combined these chemicals into more complex molecules. Then the chemicals came down there and they had this trap. Now the first experiment, the way I understand, they didn't have this trap. They allowed this go, to go in a continuous flow system like this. Total disaster. Why? The energy here and the energy here destroy the molecules that they were trying to make. Energy is no friend to evolution because what does energy do? It doesn't make things better, it makes things what? Destroy things. We're going to talk about that. Raw energy and flux of energy doesn't make things better, they destroy things. So they had to put a trap in there to protect all these molecules from you basically how they were trying to make it. Now in nature, you would not have this trap to protect it. So, the question is, I ask myself, what do they produce? Well, they produce some gas, they produce carbon monoxide. Oh, that was really good. You all like carbon monoxide, right? Nitrogen, oh, that's good, because I used to farm. Nitrogen is good, that's plant fertilizer. How many of you like to eat? How many of you like to eat plants? If you like to eat, guess what we need? Nitrogen, without nitrogen, we go on a crash diet pretty quickly. So this is good. What was the solids? They produced tar, toxic. 85% of what they produced was toxic. Then they produced acids, toxic. They tried to produce amino acids. What are amino acids? Well, how many of you like to eat meat? Meat is made of amino acids. They kind of come together like Lego blocks. We're all made of amino acids. But not all amino acids are good. There are hundreds of different amino acids. Living proteins only use basically 20 different amino acids out of the many ones that are out there. But not all amino acids are good. There's left-hand amino acids. Those are the ones that are used in living proteins. And there's right-hand ones. They're mirror images of each other. Living proteins use left-hand amino acids. If you get one right-hand amino acid in a left-hand amino acid, guess what happens? The amino acid doesn't fold, or the protein doesn't fold right. And if you get too many proteins that don't fold right in your body, guess what will happen to you? You will die. Yes. They produce roughly 50-50 of each other. They will react with each other just ready as left to left and right to right. So as I'm looking at this, what he actually produced in that experiment, it was impossible for life to evolve by chance and accident. And he didn't produce all the amino acids. And to get the sugars, the sugars are right hand. Because they also come in left and right hand. There's right hand sugars. And the chemicals that get the right hand sugars mess up the chemicals that get the amino acids. Are you with me? It's a total disaster, people. It doesn't work. And then they discover that hydrogen is leaking out of our atmosphere, so there wouldn't have been enough hydrogen for the whole equation, and I just wasted five to ten minutes of your time. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? The whole experiment was a total blunder. Wow. But did they tell you that? They didn't tell me. That's a deception. What's the natural process of chemistry? Browning of food stuff. This is the natural process of chemistry left to itself. When you drop an apple, it bruises. That's the best part of the apple, right? You like those brown, juicy parts of the apple, or you like the slimy lettuce. That's the natural process of chemistry left to itself. Yeah, the browning of food stuff is caused by amino acids reacting with sugars. And then we also have oxidation. Cell walls are destroyed, there's oxidation taking place. Yes. So we take a look at that. Not only is life made of amino acids, it's also made of sugars. And some of you are probably sweeter than others. Well, this is a really serious group. OK. <laughs> OK. We've got to lighten it up once in a while. We've got to have some fun. Now, the, the Mysteries of Life's Origin, I really like that book, because that went in with a number of PhDs. They went into life's origin. Highly recommend reading that book. Even though it's been out for a while, the science is still good. Because basically, true science, chemistry really doesn't change because God is a God of order. And I like chemistry because it's basically this orderly thing. You just put things in the equation, guess what? It comes out. It balances out. God is very orderly. Evolution is not science. 
So going through the book, raw chemical reactions. So if you had a primordial soup with the phosphates and the amino acids and the sugars and all this stuff to make all this stuff, you would have all the wrong chemical reactions needed for life because they all would randomly react with each other. You would never get life in a primordial soup. It is impossible. So chance and accident, evolution must follow the laws of nature. If the laws of nature tells you evolution will not happen, guess what we, what we must do? Reject it. But don't take my word for it. Nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves in the first living cell. We don't know how life got here from the secular realm. But as a Christian, do I know how life got here? Yeah. Somebody who has a lot of intelligence put everything together. So the present isn't the key to the past. If it can't evolve today by chance and accident, that means it didn't what? Evolve by chance and accident in the past. So. The supposed building blocks don't combine to form the long molecules of the polymers required for life, because rather the reverse happens, especially in water. We're going to take a look at that. We're going to go to this, this book. We're going to talk about that. There's another book I really highly recommend. If you really want to go to the expert, Evolution's Achilles Heel. He's got a book and he's got a DVD. I think it's Robert Carter that goes through this information. Highly recommend it. He's the expert. Because I studied this and I got a lot of the information from here. So highly recommend, because they go into greater detail. Excellent. So the name of it is Evolution's Achilles Heels. Yes. Goes through natural selection and genetics. You know, Robert Carter goes through the genetics. That's the one I really like because I learned a lot. And because, uh, you know, I studied genetics in college, and uh, we thought we were pretty smart. This has been a number of years ago. And then I'm studying genetics today. We knew nothing. We knew nothing. How do we know we know anything today? Because another 10 to 20 years, we might think, these guys are idiots. They don't know nothing about genetics. So here we have a couple of amino acids. Now, amino acids come together to form proteins. Now, when they come together, like this right here, this is where they come together. And then when they come together, what they do in the chemical reaction, they give off a water molecule. It's what I believe it's called a dehydration reaction. It's giving off water. H2O. H2O, yes, thank you. So it takes energy to go this way to start combining them like this. But the natural process of going hydrolysis in water and the thermal decay, that force going this way to break it down is much greater than the force going this way. Are you with me? So if you have this taking place in water, you know what the water would do? It would break it down to this. So anybody who tells you that life can evolve in water, he doesn't know his chemistry. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Yes. It's really easy to find out if these people are really scientists or not by what they say. It's like, that's not science. That's not how science works. See, as a creationist, not only do I study how things work, I always also study how things don't work, how these chemicals do not work. And when you start studying things, how they don't work, the whole evolutionary process falls apart really, really quickly. So the, also, amino acids can bond in a number of different sites. There's different sites where these amino acids can combine to make viable proteins. It's kind of like Lego blocks. If you're going to make something, you have to combine it and connect them in the right pot, spot, or you don't get whatever you're making. Does that make sense? You just get a bunch of gibberish, or just a bunch of Lego blocks randomly stuck together. So there's a number of sites. Amino acids have a number of sites. There's about five of them. There's one, but the normal what well, they normally combine is this alpha site, which it normally does not bind there by natural processes. It wants to bind in these non-protein forming ones. Are you with me here? Which means by the natural processes, the amino acids will not connect together to form life. It will not. They, form, they connect in the wrong spot. So as you look at the natural process of chemistry, according to chemistry, life cannot evolve by chance and accident, by natural processes. It will not work. So this is a chart of the chemistry that is taking place in your cells right now. 
These are all chemical reactions taking place in your cells. Here's another chart. All these chemical reactions are taking place in your cells right now. We're going to take a close-up. We're going to zoom in right in here. You see these all pretty little green words here? These are proteins. These are enzymes, catalysts that help in the chemical reactions. By chance and accident, natural process, you can't get one of those by chance and accident. And you probably have hundreds of thousands or millions of these proteins and so on and catalysts in your body right now. Here's another chart. This is taking place, and this is also taking place. But as we know more, guess what? We're getting more and more complex. So as we take a look, the average adult has about 60 trillion cells. There are 10 million chemical reactions taking place per second per cell. How many mathematicians in here? <laughs> you know, when I, t when I do young adults, when I teach this to young adults, you know what they immediately turn into? Creationists. They immediately evolve from an evolutionist to a creationist. They say, there's no way this is going to happen by chance and accident. Bingo. They said, Rich, somebody put me together. Whoever put us together is far smarter than any scientist or a group of scientists that has ever lived. Our DNA is a book of information, and some proteins are machines. You know you got little ATP machines in your body that are spinning around and making little battery packs called ATP? They change ADP to ATP? Yeah. Like the energized bunny? You got a better energized bunny in your body that produces this. Psalms 139. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and my soul knoweth right well. You are incredibly designed. You're a masterpiece in engineering. But as I was an evolutionist, they were talking about that DNA. We could evolve from DNA, and then that didn't work. And then we thought, well, we came from proteins. Well, that didn't work, because to get proteins, guess what you need? DNA. And to get DNA, guess what you need? Proteins. It's a catch-22. So they went to the RNA world. Well, maybe RNA put us together, because RNA can work kind of as an enzyme, but it's a very, very inefficient enzyme. But the thing with RNA, it can't take the heat. RNA is a very unstable molecule. It can't last for the millions of years it takes for life to come together. So the, it doesn't work. Nothing works. Evolution is Achilles' heel. We're going to go. Robert Carter goes into this. DNA is a four-dimensional system. This is mind-boggling. You have a four-dimensional informational system in your DNA. When you read a book, that's one dimension. Can you imagine four dimension? Here's one dimension, straight line. This is one dimension. Just all the amino or the DNA and so on in a string. Well, second dimension. We're going to talk about a few of these, not very many. We'll call alternative splicing. We'll talk a little bit about methylation. And is anybody familiar with uh, alternative splicing? OK, this is incredible. This is mind-boggling in my viewpoint. So to help it, this out, I'm going to, I did a little diagramming to show you just what's going on in your body. I was always taught one gene equals one protein. That's what I was taught. Well, they did the genome project. They discovered that as we take a look at the genome project, oh, go back here, we have about 20 to 25,000 genes. Those genes produce 100,000 to maybe up to 2 million different proteins. Depends on who you're talking to. Which means one gene has to produce what? More than one protein. So there's this alternative splicing. There's exons. I don't know if you're familiar with exons. Exons are the DNA that code for proteins. Introns, that are also in the DNA, are not coding proteins. We're going to talk about that. OK. If, if this is over the top, we're going to bring it down in a little bit. OK. Usually, sometimes when I start teaching like this, the eyes begin to glaze over. <laughs> don't worry, you're in luck, it's going to change. Because I like to go like this in my topics, get some of that maybe more educated, more of the people that like maybe a little less. But So, some proteins are manufactured through a process called alternative splicing, where exons from different locations in the genome are combined to create many different proteins. We're going to talk about that. So, here we have a chromosome. Here's the ends of the chromosome, and so on is about the center of it. And you have these little genes. 
in the chromosome. Now, here we have basically a diagram of what a gene would probably look like from a diagram purpose. You have the beginning that turns it on, and you have the end that stops, and then you have the exons, and these are the introns. So, what happens is you're going to make a protein. The DNA stays in the nucleus. It translate or transcription into a messenger RNA. Messenger RNA takes the DNA copy and goes outside the nucleus, goes in the ribosome, and makes a protein. If you're not with me, that's okay. We'll change it later. Now, this doesn't work. This is a trap transcription, but this doesn't leave the this doesn't leave the nucleus yet because this isn't finished. I always thought, oh, that's finished, that leaves. No, what has to happen, has to happen, all these, there's a process, all these introns has to be spliced out because they don't code for proteins. They're all spliced out, and then these, all these exons come together and they make the protein. They leave the nucleus, they go in the ribosome, and they make a protein. Okay, that's plan, that's step one, or one type of making a protein. Also, now it's a mature messenger RNA. It can be then trans laid it into a protein. Now, you can have the same thing here. What could happen? Those were all spliced out. But it can also splice out one of the exons. Comes together. Now you got a different messenger RNA. You can make a different protein. Now, we're just getting started, people. This is mind-boggling. So here we have it. Go through the same process. They have splice out. Then what happens is it can duplicate one of those. Put it together, now you got a different messenger RNA, you got a different protein. Yeah. Now, then take this. It can take a sequence of another gene in the chromosome, take one of those exons out, and then place it into this messenger RNA. And you got a now, you got a, another messenger RNA, you got another protein. <laughs> I'm studying this, I'm thinking, this is, wow. This is incredible. And all, it's nothing chance, chance and accident. Everything's planned. It's all orderly. So also, to going back to that gene, it can have different starting points and ending points. It may start here instead of here, or it may end here instead of here. So it can come together, and then it makes a completely different, splices those out and makes different messenger RNA, you got a different protein. They believe some of these genes can make up to 500 different proteins by just what I taught, showed you here. Now they discover that some of these proteins, see the protein doesn't work until it's folded right. And so now they discover that some of these proteins can fold into three different ways because you got chaperone proteins that can take them and fold them. And so one gene could produce up to 1,500 different proteins proteins. That's like taking a book like this and you read it, you think it's one book, but in reality it's 1,500 books in this one book. That is an informational system that's beyond what I can comprehend. That's beyond genius. But again, this is just getting started. There's more. There's methylation. Where you got these methyl groups, these methyl groups can come into the DNA and stop it from reading it into RNA. And what this can do, it can change that organism. Not a big, like it's usually driven by environmental things. It can change the petals on a plant, change the color. It can affect the, the coat color on mice by what it eats. So you can have a brown mice, and if it has a certain food, it can change, change, change you like this is an example, into a white mouse. And it can pass that down to a few generations. And then if the diet changes or whatever, it can change back to brown. Here the mouse is changing, but there's no change in genetics. It's just shedding off and turning on different genes. Oh, and then you have the third dimension. Genes are not randomly distributed throughout the nucleus. Genes that are used together on, on a series may not be next to each other, because some genes work with other genes <laughs> to get certain you know, genetic outcomes. So how do these genes work? They may not be right next to each other on the chromosome, but when they fold, those genes are together. <laughs> and then, uh, this gets, 
then you got jumping jeans. Jeans can switch on and off, and, and oh, it's just, it's crazy. Because the jeans you need when you're developing in the mother's womb, those jeans you may not need them when you become an adult. So jeans are turning on and shutting off through your lifetime. And it depends on if you exercise or what you eat can turn on and shut off certain genes. And that goes, a lot of that stuff goes all through this information. And I'm studying this stuff and I'm thinking, is God an awesome God or is he not? Yeah. We're going to simplify it a little bit now. Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, before you can come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have to believe who exists. God. Because Jesus Christ is who? God. Now, can we put Jesus Christ or can we put God in a test tube and do experiments on him and so on? No. But there's a way we can give evidence that God exists. And it's in Romans 1.20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Did you know that is the definition of empirical science? The definition of empirical science was around 2,000 years ago by Paul. Clearly seen means observation, experimentation, and so on. That's what it means. What are we experimenting and observing? Things that are made, that's creation and nature. Through studying creation and nature, guess what we get? We get understanding and knowledge. Isn't that the definition of empirical science? It is. Through science, guess what they discover? That there's a God. Actually, there's so much evidence in science that God exists, there's no excuse for anyone being an atheist. None whatsoever. When people stand before the great white throne judgment, there will be no excuse. The evidence is overwhelming that he exists. They will, ha they will not have a defense. There's no defense. So, it is time for a test. How many of you like tests and quizzes? Oh, we always get a few strange people in the crowd. That's okay. I hate tests. I hate quizzes. I love to study. But the problem is, it's hard for me to stay focused. Yes, I would not do very good in a college class, because you know what happens? It happens all the time. Is when I'm listening to a professor, all of a sudden my mind goes zoop. And if the professor calls on me, you know what happens? I have no clue what he said. Just talk to my wife about that. <laughs> it's good to have a good help meet when you're in some of these classes. So I'm going to give you a little test. It's going to be an easy one. You're all looking at these rocks. Can you pick out two rocks where it takes intelligence to make? What two rocks? Four and eight. Four and eight. When you see four and eight, what are you looking at? <clears throat> arrowheads. When you think of arrowheads, what do you think of? Who makes arrowheads? People. Now, did you see the person make these arrowheads? No. But how do these people make arrowheads? Using rocks and antlers and so on. But maybe some rocks fell off the top of a cliff, and as they fell down the cliff, they hit other rocks and hit antlers. By the time they got to the bottom of the cliff, they turned into arrowheads. How many of you believe that? <laughs> these are only a few chips on rocks. You're far more complex than this. Isn't that interesting? All these other rocks I picked up along a riverbed. Energy is going over these rocks. If I throw these two arrowheads into the river, will they become better arrowheads? No. Guess what energy does? Influx of energy doesn't cause increase in order, it causes what? Decrease. Decrease. We know that. That's the second law of thermodynamics, or the law of entropy. But we're going to take a look at atoms. Now, <clears throat> there is order in atoms. They're made of electrons, protons, and neutrons. At least most of them, hydrogen usually doesn't have neutrons, but by changing the ratio or whatever, numbers of electrons, protons, and neutrons, you come up with different atoms. That's an order. There's a type of order there. By putting different atoms together, you come up with different molecules. Like here's a water molecule, two oxygen, or one oxygen, two hydrogen. Now water vapor in the air is very disorganized, as when you cool water vapor down, it will condense into liquid water. And if you freeze liquid water, it becomes solid, which is an increase in order. This is an increase in order. But it's not the order that it takes to get life. They taught me that, oh yeah, Rich, you can make crystals. You can make crystals or you can make ice, and that's an increase in order. That means life evolved by chance and accident. No, they got, that's the wrong kind of order. How many of you are an ice cube? Mm -hmm. Or a crystal? No. All the wrong kind of order. This doesn't work. And if you leave ice in the deep freeze long enough, you know what it changes into? Water vapor. Guess where everything's going? Law of entropy. 
law of disorder. Everything's going into disorder. Yeah. So, snowflakes. There's a lot of order there. Now, what does it take to take snowflakes and change it into a snowman? It takes intelligence. And you're looking at these snow. This is a snow grandpa that's a snow granddaughter. And by looking at these snow people, you're probably thinking to yourself, it probably doesn't take a lot of intelligence, but it takes a little bit. I made those snowmen with my help of my granddaughter. Now, if you add time and energy to those snow people, you know what happens to them? They go into disorder. Time and energy is no friend to the plot. Time and energy is an enemy to evolution. Every step of science, evolution collapses. Did you know that? Every step. It doesn't work at all. So, over in South Dakota, there's this mountain range there. They got these rocks on top of these mountains. Millions of years of wind erosion and water erosion changed those rocks in the president's heads. How many of you believe that? Did you know there are two types of heads in the picture here? There are those heads and those heads. We're going to compare those heads with those heads. These heads are made from the dust of the earth. Guess what these heads are made up of? Dust of the earth. But these heads are far more complex. They can sing and dance. They can, they can write books and man in outer space. With the help of God, they can reproduce into other little heads. These heads can make those heads, but can those heads make those heads? You know what? It's far more scientific to believe that these heads were designed than those heads. Because these are simple compared to them. Over, million, over, over time, guess what's happening to these heads with time and energy? They're spending hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars, keeping those heads from falling apart. Now, if you go to the park there, and there's a person standing beside you, and he say, isn't it amazing what evolution could do over millions of years with a little bit of energy and water and wind, change those rocks in the president's heads, and they will think you're what? Crazy. They'll strip you off to the funny farm. But they'll tell you, over millions of years, I believe your head evolved from those rocks. Isn't that interesting? They call that science. But we're going to take a look at science. You know, when I was a kid, I was taught that Freddy the Frog got kissed by a beautiful princess in the short time that frog turned to a handsome prince. I was taught that was a fairy tale. Then it went off to college. Same amphibian plus the god of Mother Nature, Father Time, missed a random chance over millions of years. That amphibian can change into a uh, man, human being, and they called that was science. <coughs> Do you know this is more scientific than this? You know why this is more scientific? At least there's some intelligence here. Now, don't go home and tell your granddaughter or whatever that this man said a princess could kiss a frog and turn to a handsome prince. That's not what I'm saying. But with enough intelligence and enough power, can you take the dust of the earth and change it into a human being? Yes. How many of you read Genesis chapter 2? You know what God does? He plays in the mud. He literally plays in the mud, takes the mud together, rearranges those chemicals, breathes into that man, or that mud, and becomes a living soul. What does it take to make life? Intelligence and energy under control. How do you recognize fairy tales for children? Oh, it's pretty easy. Fairy tales with children always start once upon a time. Once upon a time in the past, this is what happened. How do you tell fairy tales for adults? It's very easy. They always start with fairy tales for adults, always start with millions and billions of years ago. So whenever I hear millions and billions of years, it's pushed in the past, it's on beyond science, it's a fairy tale. So, law of increasing entropy. Things go from order to disorder. Complex to more simple. Yeah, evolutionary philosophy says things go this way. But see, when we take a look at law of entropy, you can measure the disorder in a system. And if you take a look at nature, then seems to prefer disorder or chaos. Yeah. So according to science, this can happen. It's impossible. Yes. But we're going to look at, they say, oh, it only happens in a closed system. You know, this entropy only la works in a closed system. We have an open system. We get energy from the sun, and it can organize things. Well, here we have a closed system. Are you all familiar with that system? Some of you are, some probably aren't. It's closed, the door's closed, the window's shut, the shades are shut. There's no outside energy going into this disorganized system. Now, I was taught in college and high school, all you have to do if you want to organize something is you open the system. So I did. Open up the window, open up the shades, added some electrical energy, and the sunlight shined on this material. Will that raw energy actually organize that system? 
don't you wish it would make my life a lot easier. What would UV light do to this material? Destroys it. UV light destroys just about everything. Yes. See, an influx of energy increases entropy or disorder. Energy, the sun, is no friend to evolution because it destroys basic building blocks, destroys life, and so on. Yes. There's about one thing that can really harness this energy from the sun, and mainly it's plants. There are high-tech machines that can harness the energy, break down chemicals, rebuild them up, and make plant tissue. Now, how many of you are fond of eating? I like to eat, I like to eat the plants, I like to eat the animals that eat the plants. But without plants, guess what? Crash diet? Yeah. So what does it take to organize this closed or isolated system? Well, you moms understand this all too well. It takes what? Intelligence and power under control. Five minutes after you leave this organized system, guess what sets in? <laughs> okay, made my point. Now, I like astronomy as I take a look at astronomy. Secular science says the universe is a closed system. And if you're start, starting with hydrogen gas, that's about as disorganized as you can go. About as simple as you can go. Which means to organize this system, somebody has to come outside of this system, come into the system, and organize the system. Isn't that interesting? You know of anybody who is outside, transcendent of the system? who comes into the system and organizes the system? Yeah. Yeah. We talk about him. Space shuttles, you know, there, you know, there's an exothermic reaction taking place. Basically, there's a bomb. And when you're playing around with bombs, is there any room for air? No. If something goes wrong, guess what? People die. There's an XO controlled explosion taking place right here. But this is simple. We're going to talk about something more complex. We're going to talk about living creatures now. Here we have a frog and here we have a bug. And fro frogs like to eat what? Bugs. If they don't eat bugs, what happens to them? They die. I would like to say they croak. So this one here, he sticks out his tongue, gets the bug. Bug comes into his mouth, and now he's got lunch. But then the next picture, the bug is walking off. And you're probably familiar with the bombardier beetle. I'm sure some of you have taught about the bombardier beetle. I, this is an amazing creature. He shoots out liquids that are almost 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, this is a picture of him shooting out the boiling hot liquids. You know, as we take a look at this creature, he produces a bomb inside of his body. And he makes these two chemicals, and he makes them in this mixing chamber. With his high-tech nervous system, he senses danger, he takes these chemicals, and he opens up the sphincter muscle. It's, a, it's like a valve. He opens up the sphincter muscle. It goes into the explosion chamber. Then he has to remember to do one very important thing. He has to remember to close that valve. If he doesn't close that valve, bad things will happen to him. And then he adds a catalyst in this explosion chamber, causes a chemical reaction, a lot of heat and pressure builds up, and boom, right out of his rear section come boiling hot liquids in the face of anything that's trying to eat him. He's got two cannons. They can turn. 360 degrees, straight back, over top, between his legs, all over, and doesn't miss. Now, scientists were doing research on this bug, and they discovered that explosion is so big, it should blow the rear off of that bug. And they couldn't figure out why the rear stayed intact. So they videotaped the explosion, and then they slowed it down, and they slowed it down. They discovered it was not just one explosion. It was a multiple explosion, like a machine gun. One explosion was not big enough to blow up the rear, but multiple ones were enough to thwart anything that was trying to eat it. Isn't that interesting? They're doing research on this. This is high tech. Maybe they can make better jet motors, so on. Now, if one thing goes wrong, guess what happens to the bomber beetle? He literally blows up. Yeah. And then there's, take a look at the foot. This is not the hand of God. This is the foot of a bird. It belongs to a woodpecker. He's specially designed. He's got two toes that go forward, two toes that go backwards. And they clamp onto bark, like, uh, kind of like a vice grip. For your mechanics, they just clamp on there. He's got specially stiff tail feathers. They push the tail up there, so he's got a perfect three-point stance. And he's hitting his head up against a tree. And just before he hits his head up against a tree, he closes his eyelids. And the purpose of closing his eyelids is not so much to keep the wood chips out of his eyes, but to keep his eyes in their socket. <laughs> yeah. So, and then he's got a industrial straight beak. If a normal, normal Tweety bird would beat his beak up against a tree, it'd probably end up something like that. He's got a dustal strength beak, he's got a dustal strength skull, he's got extra layer around, muscles around his neck so he doesn't break his neck. But he's hitting a tree with a thousand times the force of gravity. 
How many of you have ever run into a post or a wall or a tree that really feels good with your, when you hit it with your head, right? Imagine the force here. Should make mush out of his brains, but he doesn't. But his beak is not directly connected to his skull. Between his beak and his skull, there is cartilage. It's like the stuff you got in your nose or your ears. And it forms a shock absorber. It's a better shock absorber than what we have in our car. So he's hitting his head up against a tree, and it's absorbing that shock. Now, what is he after? Bugs. Now, are bugs completely stupid? No. They know their lunch. So he's going through the front door, and the bug knows he's lunch, so he goes to the back door. So the bird goes to the back door, makes a hole, bug goes to the front door. So how does he get his food? He's got a specially designed tongue. His tongue is roughly four and a half times longer than his beak. His tongue is actually longer than his body. What would you do with a tongue longer than your body? Stick it in your cheeks like this? Can you imagine this creature flying through the trees with a tongue sticking out of his beak and gets snagged on a branch? That'd be bad news. So God thought of a system. He's got a special design. The tongue comes up, goes through a hole in his beak. It doesn't go down his throat. There's a hole there, splits in two, going around the neck, goes kind of in a sheet here, comes back up, and it goes back up into his right nostril. His tongue literally goes up his nose. How would you like to walk around all day with your tongue up your nose? Does God have a good sense of humor? He really does. The tongue is down here. When he's done, the tongue comes up, out the beak, down the hole. At the end of the tongue, some birds have a sticky substance called super glue. Others kind of have barbs. They kind of stick to the bug, and then they bring that bug into their beak. Now he's got this bug super glued to the, his tongue. How does he get rid of the bug, swallow the bug without swallowing his tongue? He's got special enzymes that dissolve that super glue. So you swallow the bug without swallowing his tongue. Now as we take a look at this, all these things all have to be in place all at the same time or it doesn't work. It's the same thing with life. A cell has to be fully functional all at the same time or it doesn't work. This is what we call irreducible complexity. Yes. So, now we get into mathematics. Look, Rabbi Zinger and Dr. Hoyle. He's an, agno he's an atheist, he's an agnostic as far as I know. They did the mathematical properties of the chemicals coming together to form a single cell creature similar to that of amoeba. Well, what was their results? This goes back to 1980. What was their results? Well, the probabilities is one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. That's like the number one with 40,000 zeros behind it. That's many times larger than our national debt. I mean, it's huge. The new, so according to science, anything one chance in 10 to the 150th power, anything over that is impossible. It will not happen. Now this, is, this goes back to 1980. The new research now is, is one chance in 10 to the 100th billionth power. Those are not very good odds. Wow. I don't want to bet my soul on those odds because I know I'll lose. How big is one chance in 10 to the 40,000 powers? The chance it's basically it's like a tornado going through a junkyard and assembling a Boeing 747 all fueled up and ready to fly. That's the chance. You know where they get their Boeing 747s? Out in Oklahoma, Kansas. Every time a tornado goes through, there's a Boeing 747. <laughs> no? It brings disaster. So what was their conclusion? There must be a God. But did they run out to buy Bibles? No, they're trying to find a way around it. They're always trying to find a way around it. So. But what I find interesting, as I'm reading this article, Rick Ramesseen discovered that he was very strongly brainwashed to believe that creation could not be scientific. <coughs> Is there brainwashing taking place? Big time. Yeah. So we know scientifically that life could not evolve on this planet. We know that. That's a dead end. So the new idea is life came from outer space, direct or indirect panspermia came from aliens or was seeded here, so on. And uh, how many of you are familiar with the SETI program? They're trying to find intelligent life in outer space. How are they trying to find intelligent life in outer space? They're looking for non-random radio sequences. Now, this might date the speaker, but remember when we had the old radios? When you go through the channels, you get all this static. That's a random radio signal. But then you come to a station where there's somebody's talking or music. That's a non-random radio sequence. That radio wave has been ordered. We know it takes intelligence. Well, one year they heard beep, beep, beep. They got all excited. They heard beep, beep, beep. That was a 
non-random radial sequence. They called it LG, LGM1. What does LGM1 stand for? Little green bin one. <laughs> then they studied, discovered it was from a pulsating star. The star was rotating very rapidly, giving off a regular radial signal. I mean, they hear, hear beep, 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 they get all excited. They're using the intelligent design concept, and they're using it for science. I use it, and they said that's religion. Isn't that a double standard? Change your telescopes into microscopes. You know what your DNA is screaming? Non-random sequence, non-random sequence. Someone made you. Louis well, we Pasteur, Francisco Reddy, a number of these scientists in the past, they did research refuting abiogenesis or spontaneous generation. Over 150 years of research now, many scientists, they have completely debunked the whole idea of spontaneous generation or abiogenesis. There's called the law of biogenesis. The law of biogenesis states that life comes from pre-existing life, which this is a foundational law in, in biology, which means the first life on this planet had to come from an eternal living being. That's what this law states. Do you know of an eternal living being that's always been here, that's always been alive? Science is always pointing us back to who? God, that's Romans 120. I was in a college, it was in Wyoming, I was talking about to a professor, he got a PhD in genetics, and I was talking about the law of biogenesis. You know what, he never heard of the law of biogenesis? He said, what's that? I'm thinking, what do they teach in college these days? Webster's Dictionary, A biogenesis, what does it mean? It means bio means life, genesis means generation, generation of living from non-living matter, spontaneous generation, a former theory, now what? Reject it. Going from here to here has been scientifically debunked. See, in science, it's very hard to prove things, but can you refute things, falsify things? Yes, if you can falsify it, that means we know that didn't happen. So what's the alternative? We can verify things. Yeah, somebody put us together. Science verifies that we, somebody put us together. So we talked about the laws of biogenesis first, and we didn't talk too much about this one, but first and second law of thermodynamics, laws of math, laws of logic, laws of heredity, that's, that's it, and I talk more about that. All of these laws fit in with creation. Every one of these laws reject evolution to be true, every one. Now, once in a while I get into a, a university. It doesn't happen very often. And when I'm up there standing, I'm saying evolution is not science. There are some people who get a little excited. So I like to ask questions. I ask, do you have any evidence, observational evidence, that evolution is true, that life can evolve from non-life? This is one they use every time. By performing this carefully controlled experiment, I will produce life without the least bit of intelligence needed. So I ask questions. Well, was the apparatus made by intelligent being? And they will say what? Yes. Was the chemicals used in this apparatus picked out by an intelligent being. And they will say, yes, the environment that these chemicals are placed in, was it controlled or made by an intelligent being? And they will say, yes. The energy used in this experiment, was it controlled by an intelligent being? And they will say, yes. Then I'll ask them, was every ex bit of that experiment controlled by an intelligent being, or was it all left by chance and accident? Boom, I went over their head. They don't, they don't get it. You know who gets it? That students get it. I am done. I just, they take over. I just go pack up my stuff and pack it up and leave. I'm done. The students get it. They now pick up where I just left off. Isn't that interesting? Every step of that experiment is controlled by what? Intelligence and energy under control. For this, they willingly are ignorant. They should know better. I'm just a farmer. Of that, by the word of God, the heavens were old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water. What does it take to take the elements of the earth, that's the dirt and dust and gases and water, what does it take to put them together to the, make the most complex living things in the whole new universe? It takes intelligence. And this is my wife, this is me. We have now, this picture is outdated, we now have 15 grandkids. And they didn't come about by chance and accident either. They're all dis design, and they're precious. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That is the most logical, scientific statement of how everything got here. Whether you're studying chemistry, biology, geology, or astronomy, this is the only way to explain it, right here. 
The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I didn't say that. God said that. Yes, there is a heaven and a hell. And a, heaven and a hell. It is real. God is real. There's a Savior, Jesus Christ. To have eternal life, we have to believe in Jesus Christ died for our sins. He is real. Yes. But when I travel the world, there are many gods. Why is our God the one true God and not theirs? Well, to understand who the one true God is, you have to go to Scripture. That is the most historical, most scientific prophecy book in the world. The only way I can explain the Bible is someone who is outside of time wrote the Bible. When I deal with prophecy, whoever wrote the Bible knows the end from the beginning. So, God bless you. Well, this God can't bless you, but the God of the Bible can.